Well, I'm here in Los Angeles. I'm actually in Hollywood. I can't believe this. You never think that when you sit down and you write something funny and you share it with someone else, you never think, oh yeah, that'll be a plane ticket one day. One day I'll just wake up and I'll be doing a gig in the land of dreams. You never... Yeah, it doesn't look very dreamy at the moment, but it will. It'll be magical because it's Hollywood and they're all about the magic. And we're going to bring the magic tonight. This is the magic book. This is where everything is hidden. And uh, we're going to share whatever is in this book with the audience tonight. Come on, we're going to go inside and look into this amazing shop. I, I, it is nerd heaven. If you're a nerd, you're going to come. So just, you know, cross your legs or something. Oh, oh, it's just, have you seen this? Look at this. Look. So, so happy. So, so happy. And it really does describe how I feel right now. Um, I'm going to be surrounded by English people and industry people. What? And uh, geeks, hopefully, because uh, I love geeky shit. So, uh, like Walking Dead. You see, you know you've made it when your face is in whiteboard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Nerd Melt Theater. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm very, very excited that we uh, got to have her. And I would like you to please welcome to the stage, Miss Diane Spencer. Hello, LA! This is actually my um, first time in LA. And this is my first and only gig ever in LA. Um, so thank you very much for breaking me in gently. Um, I'm sure you will. Oh, you look to me as if to go, we're not going to break you at all. Well, cheers. Well, you might. You don't know. Um, I do like LA. It's lovely. Thank you. Uh, one thing I can't get over the block system. Um, blocks are a lot bigger than they appear on the map, as I discovered when I nearly walked myself to death and had to collapse on a bench that was advertising a free HIV test. Um, I'm sure I was a positive role model for everyone there. So thank you very much. And uh, I got chatting to a nice person uh, who I think was homeless. Um, uh, apparently I was at a bus stop at this point and uh, it's nice that you put your homeless in tracksuits um, <laughs> and other sportswear because let's face it they're the only ones who walk anywhere <laughs> so well done um, now this show that I'm going to do for you it's actually uh, a show that called All Pervading Madness and I did this at the Edinburgh Fringe now um, I have to be careful because it's not my first show the one that come in don't worry just sit down you're all good um, the show that I did before was called Lost in the Mouth Specific because I like a show that's got a really fucking hard title to say. And um, when I did Lost in the Mouth Specific, I actually toured it to Australia and uh, I... <laughs> yeah, I come on and I say, hey, it's my first gig in LA. I get a golf clap. <laughs> I say Australia once and the lunatic... And yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, they don't even do that in Australia. I, you have... No shit, lady. You're from Australia. I wouldn't have fucking guessed. <laughs> thanks for being so... Thanks for breaking the barrier there. That was great. You have wonderful healthcare facilities in Australia. You do, because uh, I got a throat abscess. Um, yeah, which was where that story was going. No hygiene facilities, but the hospital's fantastic. And um, when I went there, they had to cut my throat open. And uh, they went in via the mouth. And uh, with the show title, Lost in the Mouth Specific. Yeah. I made it into the news with the headline, Irony Hospitalizes Comedian. <laughs> I did. Um, and uh, now I call my show All Pervading Madness and little mad things have come out. Like my favorite mad thing was that I've actually gained a stalker. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, he sends me photographs of erect penises. Uh, I don't think they're all his. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, I'm sure it's just supposed to freak me out, but to be honest with you, with me, it's just more like online shopping. <laughs> um, uh, and he actually sends little notes with them, like one of the notes he sent, I'm going to put the emphasis on it because it was written in capitals, so I'm going to give you what he gave me. And it just said, <laughs> big picture of a cock, You'll never get this, you ginger freak! 
I was like, you don't know how determined I am. <laughs> um, so I, I've realized that now whatever I call my show starts to actually come towards me um, in the universe. So I've already picked a title for next year. I'm just going to call it Money, Money, Money and Cock. <laughs> So uh, thank you, thank you very much for coming. Now, um, I just have to tell you a little story about my mum before I kick off into it, and it's a story that happened to my mum about, oh, I don't know, seven years ago. Basically, my mother um, was, this whole story is about one journey home. It's just one journey home that I took. We are filming it, there's a couple of guys with cameras, please try and ignore them. I'm sure you're in LA, I'm sure you can fucking do that, it's fine. Um, I'm pretty sure if I look closely enough, I'm sure we've got half the fucking cast of Law and Order in the audience, which will be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the worst thing was you said that with complete conviction, so you probably are. Um, so, I need to tell you one story because it, it's about one journey home and um, that I took at 11.30 at night and I didn't make it and at the beginning of the story I actually die. Um, so what happened was I need to tell you about my mum. Now, my mum, uh, she lives in a place called Dorset in England and uh, it's a very countrified place, uh, but she lives in the urban part in that there is a road. <laughs> and she was driving along this road and suddenly a ferret ran out uh, from the bushes. Now, it's 11.30 at night and my mum's response is to go, I bet that's somebody's pet. <laughs> and she slams on the brakes and she thinks, right, I'm just gonna get the ferret and then I'm gonna call the animal people and then in the morning, some little boy, he's not gonna wake up without his ferret. I know, she's great, interesting. So what she does is she thinks, right, I need to get the ferret. And she goes up to the first house she sees and she knocks on the door. It's 11.30 at night. No one wants to answer the door at 11.30 at night, not to a woman they don't know. And my mum knows this and so she thinks, well, I don't want to keep them long. So when they open the door and they go, hello, my mum stands there and just condenses what happens and she goes, hello, do you have a ferret or a box? It's a very sincere way of saying, hello, are you going to be part of the problem? Or are you going to be part of the solution? And they look at her and they go, we don't have a ferret or a box. No, sorry. And they close the door and she thinks, oh, you thought they'd have a box. She goes to the next house. Wham, wham, wham. Hello, do you have a ferret or a box? They don't have either. She wakes up every single house in the street till she finally gets to the last house. They've been warned by their neighbors <laughs> and they put a box outside and they wait. And they watch, and they think, please just let her take the fucking box, because we don't have a ferret. And uh, she sees the box, ah, oh, and then somehow she gets the ferret in the box. I, I've been telling this story for a year now, I still don't fucking know. And um, she put the ferret in her car, she gets in, closes the door, ready to go. Now, the ferret pokes his head out the box. She screams, she takes her coat off, throws it on the ferret, gets out the car, slams the car door. We've had an exchange now between the ferret and my mother. They've exchanged power and assets. <laughs> and my mom calls me. Where am I? I'm at home. I'm at home because it's 11.30 at night and it's my 23rd birthday. And I was at home watching Columbo. <laughs> that was all I wanted to do on my 23rd birthday because on my 22nd birthday, I got really, really drunk. I got dressed up as Supergirl and I was fingered in a disco. <laughs> So on my 23rd birthday, I just wanted to work out who'd done it. <laughs> yeah, some of these will stink. So, um, so I was there and the phone rings and my mom goes, it's not my fault. I, I know it is, whatever the fuck it is, I know it is. And I go, well, what have you done? And she tells me, and as I, I, so I get my gloves on and I get the box, I used to take my cat to the vet in, and I think, is it possible that my mother has been carjacked by a ferret? And when I get there, yes, she has, because I look inside her car and sat on the driver's seat wearing my mother's coat <laughs> is a little ferret. And he looks at me as if to go, I've done very well this evening, as you can see. <laughs> Not only do I have a disguise, but look, I've got a getaway vehicle. <laughs> but due to my small stature, if I actually want to go anywhere, I've got a massive logistics problem. Um, now, somehow, I open the car and I grab the ferret. The first thing he tries to do is rip my thumb off. He's like, ay, 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 and I think, I love you. I think you're a present from Jesus. I think Jesus sent a ferret to carjack my mother and you're now a birthday present. Fucking awesome, Charles. And I, uh, I take the ferret home, but we call the animal people and they turn up the next day and it is somebody's pet and the animal people took my ferret. 
Thank you. Well done, Jerry Springer crowd. That's good. <laughs> now, um, another thing, about a week later, I get a phone call. My mom's out at a party, and my mom, uh, my, I get this phone call at 11.30 at night again, and my mom goes, Di, the ferret is out the box. I repeat, the ferret is out the box. My first thought is, he's found her? He went back for the Toyota? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she goes, just come and pick us up. The ferret is out the box. So I turn up at my mum's friend's house where they're having this party, and uh, the ferret is out the box is actually a code. It's a code of something she didn't want to say in front of the other dining people, and the code actually means, Di, your father is now so drunk, he is now pissing in Eileen's fridge. <laughs> and I've turned up with a cat box and some gloves. <laughs> Here, Dad, try this. And um, so we use it in our family as like a little code. I like to use it in the original sense of ferret or box, ferret or box, problem or solution, go. And um, my mum loves these and she'll go like, oh, 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 ferret. And I'll go, okay, I might be pregnant. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and what's the box? I have a litre of gin. <laughs> Maybe you could roll me down some stairs. So... <laughs> yeah, that kind of is the first hurdle, but we're over it, yay! So you just need to know that about our family, it's just a little phrase that we have. Now, we fast forward seven years, it's 2010, it's 11.30 at night, and uh, I need to get home. It's really hard to get a cab, is it hard to get a cab at 11.30 at night here in Los Angeles? Yeah. It is, thank you, because it is really hard to do it in London, especially when you have blood down your front. <laughs> This is what I had. I had a big pile of blood down my front. Now, I'm going to tell you why it was there. You know, as you get older, things break, like your cough and your wee. <laughs> it's not just me, is it? No, good. You sit up a bit quick and you fart. <laughs> I was constipated and somehow, I don't know how, I glued it all together into one big lump. And when I tried to push out the one big lump, I was like, and I burst a blood vessel in my nose, yes. And blood just went Poof. Now, I don't know why my eye and my asshole are linked. It was one of those really hot ones <laughs> where you squeeze and you can feel the steam coming out of this end. And you think, am I just one tube? I don't know. Now, <laughs> some of you might be thinking, can you do a poo that big? Yes, you can. Because when I looked into the toilet afterwards, it looked like I drowned a small brown dog. <laughs> now, <laughs> at that evening, I was also doing a gig in front of a group of war veterans. I don't know if you've spotted it, but war veterans are not my target demographic. <laughs> now, I did the massive shit before I went on stage. So when I walked on stage, I say walked, I'm more limped. Um, <laughs> I tell you something, that muscle does not retract. You'd think it would. <laughs> but after you've only gone so far, it really doesn't. And I was wearing little knickers that day. If you'd have seen me naked, you'd have been like, oh my God, it's like a guitar with only one string. <laughs> <laughs> you do have the option of leaving now, if you like. And so I kind of limped on stage in front of all these war veterans and uh, covered in blood and they were like, Charlie, Charlie, don't take the purple pills. I'm fucking hallucinating again. And, um, and then I spoke. Now, uh, the problem was it was a clean comedy gig and I can do clean, that's fine. I just sometimes get confused between clean and inoffensive. <laughs> Apparently there's a way to do this and uh, I didn't modify my material so I went on in front of a room full of old people and I was like, hi, I've been told to do clean comedy like my granny's in the audience but if my granny were here she'd be in an ashtray. <laughs> uh, I got heckled, the man went, I say, and I went, yes. And he goes, is your name Di Spencer, really? And I went, yes, it really is. And he goes, what, like Princess Di Spencer? Yes, it is actually. And he goes, I suppose you have some material on her. And I was tired, so I went, oh, what, like a shroud? <laughs> yeah, basically, in a room full of pensioners, I died the quickest. Um, there were nurses watching me die going, look how quickly she's doing that. You could learn a lot from her. So, <laughs> so 
after my gig, I, I, I had landed and I, you see, I had been on a plane and I was covered in blood and I just thought, I just want to go home because I've just upset a room full of old people. So I just got my coat, I got my little suitcase. Um, I'd been awake for about 28 hours because I used to live in New Zealand. Um, and uh, I just, so this is my little suitcase. So I thought, I'll just get a taxi and I'll go home. So I got in the taxi rank and I waited. Now I couldn't look down because I personally, uh, I don't like blood. I faint. Uh, I gave blood once. I think I've only got two pints of blood. And I think they just migrate to wherever they're needed. And if you only have two pints and you give one away, that's basically your front half. And uh, I didn't just fake. come in, pop it, don't worry, don't worry, come on in, come on in. That's all right. Yes, you have to sit in the fucking front. You're late, what the fuck do you think? <laughs> Penalty for being late. You're in the wet zone. I spit. <laughs> um, so I was giving blood, and basically, um, I didn't. Once you give away, you know, a pint, um, I, I had a seizure. Um, that was okay in itself, but the problem was we were in an open plan blood giving room, so you could see what everyone else was doing. So there were people walking in, kind of going, "Oh, isn't this lovely? Look, that's where you talk to the nurse. Great. Oh, look, that's the tea and biscuits. Sound nice. Oh, and that over there. That's the." <laughs> and um, weirdly enough, uh, people were walking in to give blood and changing their minds. <laughs> you could hear them, you could hear them going, it's so important that you give blood, it's so important that you give back to society, and um, fuck this, no we're not. <laughs> and um, basically, I fell asleep in a room and I woke up and it was empty. And uh, for my one pint, 24 had walked out the building. Yeah. And um, I tried to make a joke with the nurse because I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble. And I kind of went, <laughs> you know that pint you just took? Could you keep it warm? I think I'm going to need it back in a minute. <laughs> and she just looked at me and went, <sighs> are you allergic to band-aids as well? <laughs> and I just thought, you mean bitch? So I went, yeah, stick it on, watch the finale. <laughs> Uh, I don't like blood so much, I've actually fainted during films. Uh, I've fainted during Interview of the Vampire. There's a scene, uh, if, has anyone seen Interview of the Vampire? Yeah, go, if you haven't, it's about vampires. <laughs> and um, there's a scene where a vampire bites a woman's boob and her boob bleeds. Uh, I learned a very important lesson that day. I have to watch horror films in a recliner. Um, if you hear a clunk, I'm not relaxed, I'm just unconscious. And uh, once I saw this, uh, I had a date coming around and he said, I'm going to bring a scary film to the date. And I was like, yeah, 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 I know why you're bringing a scary film. And uh, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's obvious because men always bring a scary film to a date so that you, you're supposed to sit there with the lights turned down low and they get to be the man. And you're supposed to be all like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> You're so brave, oh. <laughs> the thing is, I'm going to do that anyway. Um, by bringing a film, he's actually making himself wait. Uh, but people are kinky, what can you do? So he goes, I'm going to bring a scary film. And I go, yeah, all right. And then he goes, I'm going to bring Saw 6. And I'm like, shit. Uh, I don't know if any of you, have you seen the Saw films? They're gory, they're so gory. I don't, I mean, whoever wrote these, Jesus Christ, there's only one person who's seen more human mutilation and that's Joan Rivers' surgeon. And I was just like, I, I can't watch Saw 6, you can't bring it on the date because I'll faint. And I can't faint when I'm on a date because that's when I wake up with testicles on my eyes. <laughs> it's the joys of dating other comedians. And um. And I thought, how can I watch Saw 6 and not get teabagged? <laughs> and then I came up with an idea. I thought, what I'll do is, I'll watch the making of documentary, and that way I'll know how they did it, and it'll take away from it, and I won't be scared. Now, the way that they did it, it's amazing. Uh, they have two actresses, because in the first scene of Saw 6, a woman hacks her arm off whilst her hand is moving. It's incredible. And uh, the... They've got two actresses, and one actress is the big actress, and she's kind of there, and she does all the filming and stuff, and all the interviews, and she has one arm sellotaped behind her back. Yes, I'm sure it's sellotape. And, um, 
And then they, she's got a fake arm, and it goes all the way down to actress number two, who plays the hand. <laughs> and she spends the entire scene in a box, presumably on the phone to her agent. <laughs> and uh, it was great, because this top woman, she was so excited, she was going, oh my god, I can't wait for this scene where I get to hack my own arm off. I've never been able to do that before. It's great, my agent said I should lose weight anyway. And so I was like really excited and the guy comes around, he brings the DVD and he puts it in and I'm like, oh, excited, okay, lights down low. <laughs> oh yeah, not yet, yeah, yeah, watch the film. And, um, and the film starts and I recognize my woman and she's there kind of, she does all her act to go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And the hand's going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then she picks up the hand, she goes, <laughs> and she just goes, Aah! and blood flew everywhere. And I'm watching with the date and I go, yeah, you fucking cut that shit, bitch. And then he refused a blowjob. <laughs> yeah. Apparently nobody wants to put their cock in the mouth of a mental. <laughs> Especially one who's demonstrated they like amputation. Like in the middle of my lounge, I'm just going to chisel his cock off with my teeth. It's ridiculous. So... So I was waiting for a cab and blood down my front and my little suitcase and I was exhausted and I just wanted to go home. So I walk up to the taxi driver, I finally get to the front of the queue and I'm like, right, great. Now, I felt really bad about, you know, doing really badly in that gig and I just felt awful. And comedians, we have a word when a gig goes badly and I didn't think about it. And I went up to the taxi driver and I was just thinking about it so much. I went, I am so relieved to see you. I have just had the worst death of my career and I'm covered in blood. And he doesn't know what I do for a living. <laughs> And you can see him trying to work it out. He's going, what the fuck does she do? Best case scenario, she's some kind of epileptic butcher. <laughs> Worst case scenario, we've got the world's most confident murderer here. <laughs> she's got a suitcase full of body parts. And I think if I give her a ride, I'm going to go from cabbie to accessory. And uh, weirdly enough, he turns around and he goes, yeah, sorry, darling, I don't speak English, yeah? <laughs> I was like, well, I partially agree with you, but I think you're lying. Uh, I think you do speak English, I want to go home. He's like, yeah, no, 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 don't speak English, and neither does Kev. And um, I was refused by a whole taxi rank, and I thought, great, I need to get home. It's 11.30 at night, I'm covered in blood, and I have to get home on public transport. <laughs> Fuck it, I might fit in. So I went to a bus stop, and I stood there. Now, the first thing I noticed at the bus stop was this young lady, and she was beautiful. She had, bless you, she had um, gorgeous hair, and she had not one, but two mobile phones. That's not too unusual in this day and age, but what I did love was that she was simultaneously texting on both at the same time. That's what simultaneous means. And she was just going for it, and I was quite impressed. And then I noticed she was wearing a wonder bra, and her tits were kind of shoved up, but the wonder bra was too small, so there was kind of a line and it meant that her boob was spilling over. But it meant that, in essence, she had a boob here, and a boob there, and a boob here, and a boob there. And I looked at her and I thought, you've got two phones and four tits. <laughs> I want to see what you look like if I cross my eyes. So I just kind of blurred my eyes a little bit, <laughs> just to kind of, you know, and she morphed, it was great. And her two phones became four phones and her four tits became eight tits. And I was like, fuck me, she's like the incarnation of Shiva in high heels. <laughs> and then um, she did this, she went. Wee! I was like, oh fuck her ovaries, but no. <laughs> now she didn't do this. Wee! Hello? No. Wee! Hello? No. She did this. Wee! Hello? <laughs> Hi! I was like, really? Really? the same, and I couldn't help it. I said it out loud, I went, oh my God. Four tits, two phones, and one ring to rule them all. <laughs> she wasn't impressed. She went like this, she went, hang, ow. She went, <laughs> well, hang on. Yeah, carry on. I was like, fuck shit, I'm a status update. Now. <laughs> At this point, I thought, good, the bus driver's coming. I can just get on the bus, go home and ignore it. Now, as the bus was pulling up, um, the bus driver's in LA. I've not been brave enough to get on a bus yet uh, in LA, mainly because every time I go near a bus stop, there's a man holding about like eight carrier bags who yells at me. 
Um, he seems to be at every bus stop. <laughs> I don't know who he is. <laughs> I don't like him at all. Um, so uh, I haven't gone on a bus yet, but can you tell me, do your bus drivers come in little plastic cases? They don't? Oh, nice, because we have them in London. In London, all our bus drivers come in little plastic boxes, and they've got, like, air holes, and that's it. And um, you have to kind of leave them in there. If you leave your bus driver in his little plastic case, he appreciates in value year on year. No. Um, the reason why he's in there is because, basically, people in London are stabby, and bus drivers <laughs> are cunts. So <laughs> it's a good relationship there, you know? And... Um, as the bus pulled up, somebody obviously had a fight with this bus driver early on in the evening, and they'd taken it out on his little plastic palace because they couldn't get to him. And they'd got out a marker pen, and they'd gone, well, fuck you. And they'd written a word on his screen. <laughs> but it was where they put it, because it was quite small and quite high, and it just said, dick. <laughs> so when he pulled up, and he opened the door, and he looked at me, and he looked at me with a look that said, don't fucking mention it. It said, Dick, <laughs> wouldn't you lean? Like, if that was your bus and that was your screen, wouldn't you be like, hi, everyone, just get on the bus. <laughs> don't worry, I don't care if you haven't got the money, just get on, it's fine. But I kind of stepped up and I was like, oh. And straight away he goes, is that blood down your front? And I went, is that a dick on your head? <laughs> Out of the two of us, you're doing much worse. And he was like, Get off my bus! And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I need to go home, please, please. I'm exhausted. I've just bombed in a room full of war veterans, please. <laughs> Get off my bus, you're a health hazard! And I was like, health hazard, you don't know the meaning of the word. And he wouldn't, let, he wouldn't let me get on the bus, so I had to just bail. And before I went, I was like, don't think you're fucking safe. I will hunt you down. I will bring cheese in my pocket. And the next time I see you, I'm going to bung up your little air holes, you motherfucker. <laughs> so I got off the bus, and I ran into two phones. And two phones goes... Is that blood down your front? And I went, what are you, a bus driver? And she goes, <laughs> she goes, no. But I know what dried blood looks like, yeah? I'm a hairdresser. <laughs> I was like, what kind of fucking Quentin Tarantino reservoir dogs hairdresser are you, my love? Just hacking a little off the ears. She got on the bus, they drove off, and I turned around a little bit too quick and just went <laughs> into a lamppost. Genuinely, my first thought was, does this happen in real life? Um, now, there's a reason I walked into the lamppost. It's because I have an eyesight problem. Um, basically, I went to the optician, and the optician said, your left eye isn't right. And I said, well, that's why you're not a doctor. <laughs> and basically, he said, right, this eye, um, this eye I can see to the end of the room. This eye I can see to about here. He said, this, madam, is your field of vision. Basically, I'm really good at reading maps at the beginning of long corridors. <laughs> and um, he said, if you pay me 70 pound, which is about $90, he goes, I will give you a pair of glasses to correct this. And I said, no, I'll give you 35 pound, and you can just give me a monocle. <laughs> now, the problem is, apparently, he didn't do monocles. <laughs> at his opticians, and he said, but I can give you, instead of doing a monocle, I can give you a free pair of glasses with your other pair, that way you'll have two pairs of glasses. I was like, no, you've just made it financially worse. <laughs> I need one lens for one eye. You want me to spend 70 pound on four lenses for one eye? That means the price of one lens has decreased. It was 35 pounds, it's now under 20 quid. I might not have seen you coming with this eye, but I certainly saw you coming with this one. <laughs> now also on this side of my face is this tooth here. Uh, this is, yes, I know, this is true, pretty much everything is true, it's a shocker. This tooth started off life here, and instead of growing down, it grew up. Yes, I'm in a book. <laughs> I'm in a book for trainee orthodontists. Uh, you can't recognize me, because this is the photo. Um, that's going to be next year's poster, Money, Money, Money and Cock. And uh, the dentist said, we need to cut up your face. We'll attach a chain to the tooth and pull it down. <laughs> English dentistry, who knew? <laughs> and, um, and what happens was I said no. And then he goes, well, we need to, because otherwise your tooth will keep growing up your face. And it will poke out of your skin somewhere near your nose. And you will have a tusk. <laughs> 
I thought, you know what, I think a tusk would look quite good with a monocle. I think it would take away from the ginger thing. You know, I think instead of people going, who's Diane? She's a ginger girl. I'll go, who's Diane? And I'll go, oh, she's the ginger girl with the monocle and the tusk. <laughs> Take her your beer, she can open it, it's great. Um, but also on this side of my body, there's um, a, this little mole. And as I've got older, it grows a hair. Um, yeah, it's quite thick, it's like a little splinter. And um, a friend of mine once said to me, he goes, your hair's got very long. And I said, oh, do you think so? And he went, no. <laughs> oh, what? What's this? And he goes, I went, yeah. And he goes, there on your face. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he said, it looks like your mole is weaving an escape rope. <laughs> and I said, can you pull it out? And he said, OK, I'll try. And I thought he'd do this, like tweezers. No, it was long enough that he just yeah, he wrapped it round his finger and he, he went, I'm scared. And I went, what are you scared of? And he goes, I'm scared if I pull this out, I'll rip half your face off. <laughs> he goes, what if I pull this out and I unthread your eyebrow? I was like, it's not a tree, just pull it out, right? It was fine, it had a waxy plug on the end, but it was fine. But then a couple of weeks later, it had grown back and I was there like this. I was like, I wonder. <laughs> it's a fucking good look, isn't it? I just need a pipe. I was like, I wonder, if I just let this grow, will it grow to the width of my body? I thought this one day when I was trapped behind the sofa. So I just... <laughs> I just kind of let this grow and then I had a date and I thought, well, I don't want to turn up to the date looking like one half of Mr. Miyagi. But equally, I'm not going to risk what I titled Project A. So what I did was I just took the end of the hair and I just wrapped it round my earring. <laughs> and then I wore my hair down like this, yeah? Subtle. And uh, when the date turns up, I was like, hi. Going. I was kind of flirting around, oh, blah, 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 blah. and I just did that. And, I, and he went, oh, you've missed one. And he reached, I went, no! And uh, I wish I'd gone that way. Because I went that way, um, it, I pulled the skin between the mole and the ear, and instead of the hair coming out, the earring came out, and then trapped in the hair, swung down. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of his reaction. And uh, I was like, but you don't admit a mistake, do you? You just went, I just went, surprise! Uh, <laughs> Yes, not only do I have a whisker, but look, I've put a little diamante in it for you. <laughs> so as I was headbutting the lampposts, <laughs> I thought, right, I can't take a taxi, can't take a bus, so I ran to the train station. And uh, I had to catch the last train of the night, and uh, I managed to get it. Now, I live in a little place called Surbiton. It's tiny, it's just outside London. Uh, but it should be like this far away from London on a train line. But because it was the last train of the night, we kind of went via everywhere else before we were going to get there. We were basically going to Surbiton via Libya and Purgatory. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not doing very well with people this evening, so I'll just find a carriage with the fewest number of people. And I found one with just a bloke and a couple. And I was like, perfect. And I got in there, and the carriage set off. We're good. Hooray, I'm going home. Can I just pause and say, because the guy's taking photographs, can you stop it, please? Because it's now just putting me the fuck off. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that feels so good. I feel like pissing myself out of relief. Um, <laughs> so anyway, where was I? Right, so we're on a tra carriage, we're going home. Now for the first time, I actually look at the people who I'm sharing this carriage with, and I look at the first guy, and I suddenly realize he's homeless. Okay, that's all right. And I look at him, but he looks at me, and we lock eyes, and in that one second he goes, I'm an undercover policeman. No, you're not. <laughs> No, you're not, because you smell of piss. <laughs> Unless undercover policemen do the method uh, here. I don't think you do. And he went, ah, I'm an undercover policeman. No, you're not, because they're not that convincing. I don't know if you've run into an undercover policeman in England. Uh, they're not. They, they tend to approach you near kebab vans. Uh, they look like they're out of the musical Oliver. Um, 
they're the only people who still wear kerchiefs and they don't know what the street slang is. They just get it wrong and they kind of wobble up to you in their big coats and they go, pun it of skunk, me lady. <laughs> no, I'm fine, thank you, officer. Um, and uh, he goes, I'm an undercover policeman. Give me your purse and all your money or I'll have you arrested. I was like, oh, it's his business plan. <laughs> I get it now. Do I get a sticker? I was mugged by Hobo Cop. And um, I just go, I just went, no, no, I'm not good. I go, ha and you have to call their bluff if they do this. So I went, all right, why don't we go to the station together? And he goes, no, no, I can't go to the station. I have paperwork to do. And he picked up a newspaper and he started making, I think it was a hat. It could have been a saucepan. I don't know. And I just took my little suitcase. I thought, I'll just move away from him and I'll sit near the couple because couples are safe. And I sat down and I looked at them and this was my reaction. Ah! And... I thought it was my ex. Now that's a reasonable reaction considering he ruined Sunday morning. Do you know how Sunday morning is the best time to have sex? Not in LA, it's not. <laughs> You're all kind of looking at me as if to go, no, actually, it's Tuesday at seven. That's what we should all be fucking doing. But we're here instead, listening to you, Ginge. Thanks, thanks a bunch. Nice planning there. Um, well, I personally feel Sunday morning is a nice time to have sex because, you know, you haven't got really anything to do. You can hear other people in church. <laughs> and uh, the sun's coming in through the window. It's nice. You're a bit stinky, a bit smelly, but you roll over. You're like, it's nice. That was kissing, by the way. <laughs> well, um, it's nice. Well, we were there, you know. I'm a catch. And, um, <laughs> and he rolled off and lay on his back and started playing with himself. That is antisocial. <laughs> I'm still in the room. You don't go into autopilot when your partner's there. It's like, I want to join in, but I can't because you're doing everything for me. What am I, how can I be involved? <laughs> Come on, honey, you can do it! And he's just there. And then finally, he says something which I'll never forget. He goes, call me a slut. <laughs> I thought I'd rather call you a cab. <laughs> but okay. And I went, all right, you're a slut. And he went, yeah, I'm a slut. I was like, oh, oh okay, okay. We've, uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've broken the dam now. Okay, that's fine. Just relax. He's a slut. This is fine. Okay, this is good. I've done acting before. I can act my way through this. You're a slut. That's cool. We're all cool. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> and then he says something I will never forget, and I quote. He goes, stick your finger up my ass. <laughs> now, I had never done this before. Notice the past tense. And I thought, am I really going to do this? And I thought, well, I should, because number one, I don't want to look like an amateur. <laughs> um, you know, I'm 30, I should have done this by now. And uh, the other thing I thought was, I, I should do it because I don't want to spoil the mood. Um, I know, by the mood, I mean his mood, because my mood was fucked. And um, I was kind of approaching, and he's like, oh. And um, I thought, am I really going to do this? And then a tiny little voice in the back of my head said, well, mommy always said one day a man would want to put a ring on my finger. Oh. Do you know what the best thing about that joke is? I've ruined a Beyonce song for so many people. <laughs> and, then, and so I thought, right, here we go, right, ready? And now I have no idea where a man's chocolate pipe is. I really have no idea. I know it's somewhere down there. So I was just jabbing him in the ball sack for about five minutes thinking I know it's around here somewhere. I'm sure I'll get to it eventually. Um, and then I thought, right, it really looks like I don't know what I'm doing. I thought, relax, Dan. Okay, just pretend that he's a cat and you're a vet. Just, <laughs> just lift his little tail and insert. Now, uh, the problem with this is, as most of you know, a man's chocolate pipe is not located between his penis and his testicles. No, if it was, then uh, there would never be any blowjobs and gay men would never have beards. No. <laughs> That's a good one. Let it mature. And... Um, 
so I thought, right, I, 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 I thought I need to get there soon because I really look like I don't know what I'm doing. I thought I don't want to pick him up and overstretch and tap him on the shoulder. Um, so what I did was I did what my Australian friends would call I followed the bush trail. In that I lifted up his testicles with three of my fingers and I did this weird snaky thing where I kind of just combed through all the flora and fauna and I thought, well, I'll get there eventually. And, um, and I did. And I found it. I was like, yes, right. Ready, Aladdin? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, fuck, I wish I'd cut my nails. Uh, uh, can I tell you, it is really hard to get your finger up there. It doesn't just happen magically. And the problem is, if you haven't tried this yet, can I tell you now, you cannot have a bright idea halfway through. Halfway through, you can't go, wait a minute, I know what I should have done. Hang on. There we go. Yes, obviously you can't do that. <laughs> this is why I don't gig in restaurants. And um, <laughs> obviously you can't do that. And you don't want to swap fingers because you've already started with this one now. And this one is what we would call the Gary Glitter finger. <laughs> you know, no one wants to go near that till it's cleaned up its act. And um, so I was kind of there. And he slows down and he goes, do you know what you're doing? That's just fucking rude. So I just went, yes, I know what I'm doing, you slut. And I grabbed his leg, pulled him apart. And I just went, Bruh! like that. And uh, he went, ah! And in like the five seconds I was up there, I'll tell you what I found. Um, I found a walnut. That's the best way to describe it. It was like a little walnut. And I thought, is that the inside of your belly button? <laughs> to be honest with you, judging by the look on his face, I think it could have been the back of his optic nerve. Um, <laughs> And I, I went, I'm sorry, and I pulled it out, and I ran to the bathroom, and I was like, <laughs> and I looked in the mirror, and that's when I saw it, the brown thimble. Aww. Yeah. And I was like, uh, I was like, you yeah. I was like, no, and I was like, is this what happens when you're 30? <laughs> is this what happens to sex? And um, it really made me upset. So to cheer myself up, I used his toothbrush to get that off. Don't judge until you've been there. Um, now, we broke up soon after that, mainly because his breath smelled. And um, <laughs> are you off to be sick or are you coming back? <laughs> oh, good. I've had walkouts before. It's fine. And um, now we broke up and my friend went, you broke up with him? You can't. You're 30. I was like, OK, I know I'm no good at maths, but I really don't understand how this co correlates. I broke up with him not because I'm 30, but because every day he was using me as a pipe cleaner. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, no, die, you don't understand. You, now, you don't have a boyfriend, you don't have a baby, uh, and no offense, but you don't really have a job. <laughs> so, you know, where are you going with your life? I was like, to be honest with you, it sounds like I can go wherever I like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to L.A., <laughs> maybe Disneyland, who knows? And uh, she was like, this is it. This is what I'm talking about, your attitude. And she goes, you have to accept. If you haven't settled down by the time you're 30, you have a problem. I was like, no, pop it. It's pronounced personality. <laughs> but to calm her down, I joined a dating website. But to punish her, I only showed her the perverts. Because when you online date, there's so many to pick from. <laughs> My two favorites, uh, the first one, he sent me four photographs. And they usually show you, has anybody here done online dating? Thank you for nodding. And two people, hook up. Um, so I, like, there was one guy and he sent me these four photographs. And like, um, the first photograph was him like, usually they're kind of like action shots. Like, it's usually like, oh, this is me. I'm extreme snowboarding in Norway because I'm athletic. And uh, this is me speaking French. <laughs> it's usually crappy photos like that. It's like, this is me digging a well in Sudan for Chinese burnt orphans. And um, <laughs> it looks like Richmond Park in Surrey. And, um, but this guy, he sent me four photographs. And the first photograph was of him in his bathroom wearing a pair of Speedos. Nice. But he had r a rather large stomach. Yeah. And it was quite hairy. It was like, show off the six pack, not the keg. And um, he was kind of there in his bathroom. And the photo was taken with his camera phone. So the lighting was fantastic. <laughs> and there was a banana. And I thought, why have you got fruit in your bathroom while you're stood there in your underwear? <laughs> 
none of this makes sense. I thought, right, what's picture two? <laughs> picture two, he'd lost the speedos. He was now naked, but he wasn't showing me the rest of the fruit. He had put his leg on the bath and was showing me what I would call the tradesman's entrance. <laughs> and, uh, and he was showing me this and uh, kind of, you know, and he had the banana in his hand. Yes, you guess where photo number three went. <laughs> photo number three, he was, let's put it politely, inserting the banana into his digestive system. <laughs> Just the wrong way. Just like, I mean, you know, do we need instructions with fruit now? I don't know. If you saw a monkey do that, if you were there and you saw a monkey in the zoo going, <laughs> you'd just smack it, wouldn't you? You'd be like, no bubbles, that's not what we do with our food. Um, <laughs> then the fourth photograph, he had got the banana so far up his bum hole that it looked like his testicles had a stand. <laughs> do you know what the title of his email was? Want to play? Oh, please. <laughs> Please, if there's one thing I can do with my life, playing fruit smuggler with you is gonna be number one on the list, isn't it? <laughs> and um, so, so I quite enjoyed Banana Man, that was fine. But then the second one, now I just wanna see who would have opened this, because obviously I did. Show of hands, uh, it was from someone called Toilet 2010. <laughs> I'll repeat that. <laughs> really? Toilet? Anybody, who would have opened it? <laughs> Fucking thank you, at least there's two honest people in the room. The rest of you are like, no, I wouldn't have. Yes, I would. Um, I, I opened it like this, I was like, uh. No photographs, sadly. One line. Would you shit on my chest? <laughs> now, let's get hypothetical. Let's say I email this person back. Now, if I was going to email somebody back who opened with the line, would you shit on my chest? I would respond with a joke. I'd be like, oh, only if you eat it. <laughs> uh, but that's something you shouldn't do with perverts. <laughs> they don't know when you're joking. And um, so let's say that we emailed backwards and forwards for a little while. And then let's say we found out we discovered we had something in common. I don't know, films. And then let's say that he came around to watch a film and he was like, I'm gonna bring Saw 6. And I'm like, oh my God, okay. And, um, and then let's say we watched the film together. I screamed at the television, who knew? And then uh, he paused the film and he turns to me and he goes, look, can I be honest with you? You're kind of freaking me out. And I was like, really? <laughs> I'm freaking out toilet 2010. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, can I be honest with you? Um, I only came here to do one thing. Can we do it? And I am about to go, no, 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 no. I thought we were just gonna watch a film. No, no, you can go. But before I can get that sentence out, he turns to me and he goes, I need to be really honest with you. I don't want you to shit on my chest. <laughs> I wrote that email as a bet, but you're the only person who actually <laughs> responded. <laughs> I don't want to offend you and the things you're into. And I just went, all oh, right, yeah, thanks. Thanks for being so sensitive. Okay, cool, right. Well, yeah, we better do it, so bet, hey. All right, well, um, all right, go upstairs, wait in the bath. I'll be up there in a minute. And he went up and I thought, no, you do not come to my house and tell me that I'm the freak. No. And I thought, how can I deal with this man? And I remembered Banana Man because you have to play top trumps with these people, do you know what I mean? And so what I did was, I, I went to the, the kitchen and I was like, right, I've got about five minutes to do this, I've got to be brave. And I thought, right, I don't want to use a banana because a banana, that's got edges, that's curved, that's all wrong. And I thought, what have I got? And I looked in the fridge and I had a cucumber and I thought, well, cucumber could work, but if I've got a walnut up there and then I put a cucumber up there, actually, I'm kind of halfway to a Waldorf salad. And then I thought, this is not the time for recipes. So I looked and I had a plate of cold cooked sausages and I was like, that's actually perfect because they were also covered in lard. Oh. And so I was like, right, now it, it's, can I tell you, it's very liberating to be naked in your kitchen. And I was there like, and I thought, right. And I was like, am I really gonna do this? Um, and I thought, well, I should do this. And I, I, I mean, I have never taken anything too far up the chuff before. But you know when you're having sex, and I have been stabbed in the eye. You know when kind of you're having sex and he pops out and he jabs you in the eye. 
Am I the only one fucking the clumsy people? <laughs> they all kind of looked at me mystified, like no one's ever had that before. <laughs> really? Is it really just... <laughs> Fuck. Am I just shit at observational comedy? It's just, I'm observing the worst shit in the world and nobody else is. <laughs> you should thank me. I'm the bullet shield. And um, so, like, yes. If, uh, by the way, if anybody does jab you in the arsehole, which I've had on countless occasions, it's always a mistake, no matter how many times the same clumsy fuckwit does it. Um, uh, I have a little phrase for them now. It's to do with train stations in England, and you're free to use it. If somebody jabs you, they just say, Paddington, please, driver, not Waterloo. Um... <laughs> So I, what I did was I got the sausage and I thought, right, I just need to get it between airlock one and airlock two. Some of you know what I'm talking about, some of you don't. And um, I was like, right, so Aladdin went to work and I was like, huh. and it's weird because did you know you have a gag reflex both ends? Like um, when you try and actually put something in there, your bottom wants to throw it up. It's, uh, it's an incredible feeling. But I managed to get it up and I thought, I can just hold it in place, it's fine. I kind of clenched, pull everything up and I was like walking upstairs like this, like, oh, oh, this doesn't feel good. And I go upstairs, but he's in the bath. And I'm like, yes! And he looks terrified. And I think, not terrified enough. No. And I was like, are you ready? And he was like, yeah. I just, oh. <laughs> and um, it's great because the little sausage just slid out and just went plop on his chest. And I looked down and I went, ah, ha, 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 I really must chew my food. <laughs> Hypothetically. Um, <laughs> um, now, uh, before I carry on, uh, I just need to address the balance because I've just told you a couple of stories where the men were perverts and I was like the innocent party with the sausage at my bum. Um, so I just need to redress it and to redress the balance so you don't go away going, oh, Diane Spencer, she was sexist. Uh, I'm going to tell the men one of the women's secrets. Sorry, okay? Women, right now, I apologize. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. You can come back, sit down if you like while I'm apologizing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. Right. You know how Saturday, you see, Sunday night is the nice time to have sex because Saturday night you've done your Olympic routine of sex? Just me again? No, you know this, you know this. When you go out on Saturday night, you have one too many jars and you look at the person and you think, oh, do you know what? You're in for a treat tonight. Because <laughs> I'm not just going to have sex with you, no. I'm going to fuck you and you're going to know how good I am at fucking you. Tonight, Bob, we're going to leave the lights on. It's that routine, you know, we're kind of... Where well, you look at the person you're gonna fuck and you think, I'm gonna impress you. I've not impressed you for the last four fucking years of our relationship, but I'm gonna impress you tonight. And uh, as a woman, you end up in one of two positions if you're trying to impress. You either end up doing some weird handstand shit where you're kind of like this going, just pick up my other leg. Just, it's fine, I'll be fine. It, actually, actually, it's not gonna work. Let's start on the bed. You go behind and then when we start, I'll just fall onto the floor. Um, <laughs> But sadly, if you do start doing that and he does pick you up, eventually you're like, you know, I can't do a press up normally. And you kind of end up with your face getting rug burn on your chin as he's just like plowing your face into the floor. Because <laughs> he's already started now and he's not going to stop. And um, you're kind of there going, honey, I know you wanted me to eat carpet, but this is not what I was <laughs> envisaging. You either end up in that position or you end up doing uh, what I affectionately call the squat. You know when you want to show off and look athletic and you're kind of there going, yes, isn't this good? The light is here, it is casting a shadow. I know that I'm only lit on one side, I look thinner. And you're kind of there going, stomach in, tits up, blah. And um, you're there going, yes, yes, full frontal, lucky fucker, aren't you? Yes, because that's what you want in a girlfriend, the ability to look like a slag. And um, you're there bouncing away. Now, can I tell you something? Can I tell you what we're actually thinking while we're doing this, men? While we're there doing this, trying to impress you, what women are actually thinking is, I think my thigh muscles are ripping my fucking kneecaps off. <laughs> and instead you just go, could we please move closer to the headboard? Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And you say politely, are you coming yet? <laughs> are you? 
Are you coming yet? I'm losing feeling in my leg. Are you coming yet? You come now, you bastard, or I'm going to punch you in the fucking face. And finally, he comes, you quit, and you fall asleep with a clitoris like a weeping purple grape. <laughs> That's Saturday. Sunday, you wake up and kind of, he wakes up first. Now, this is it. He wakes up first and he thinks, oh, that was amazing. That was really fun last night. She did that thing. Yeah, it was dirty. And he looks across and you're asleep and he thinks, round two. <laughs> Ping. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I've made something for you. <laughs> wake up and you like I'm only just awake I'm so dehydrated I can't open my fucking eyes and you can hear this <laughs> you're like no it's not gonna work and you think I wanna have sex I do but I know it's just gonna be all dry and squeaky up there <laughs> it's really not gonna work and uh, you think I've only got five seconds to make a decision because if you turn around and you go no thanks uh, he's gonna go, all right, he's gonna wank off, that's it, you're not gonna get sex for the rest of the day. So you have to somehow make it happen, and you're like, I don't have any lube, I can't, I've only just woken up, I can't be bothered to go through my wank bank right now, it's just, <laughs> I can't connect. And you think, I'm just gonna have to say no. And men, this is our secret. When we really want to have sex, we go, wait a minute, we had sex last night. And then we have a cheeky feel inside, we go, ah, I see we still have the mess he left last night. <laughs> go on then, give it a try. And he goes, all right, I'll be gentle. I know you've just, oh my God. Oh my God, you're already wet. <laughs> I knew you wanted it, you dirty bitch. And you know what, chaps, I'm really sorry, but what you don't know is you're just smashing last night's porridge. <laughs> Some people happy at this, some people not. That's okay, that's okay. So anyway, so I see this couple on the train. <laughs> My reaction, ah! Yes, we are, we're still on the fucking train. And, um, and I look at him and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Um, is it my ex? And I check. No, it's fine. Now, I relax. And now, the weird thing is, he passes out. And the girl, she gets up and she goes, what's your fucking problem? Come on. And she starts to wake him up. She starts lap dancing for him, right? We're on a train, she's lap dancing, I'm literally two feet away. And uh, I mean, this is, this is quite normal, it's lap dancing, it is 1 a.m. And to be honest with you, like, uh, you know, that's an appropriate form of exercise at 1 a.m. lap dancing. If you see somebody jogging at 1 a.m., it looks like they're fleeing a scene. So she's there kind of grinding away, and at this point, our train pulls into the next station to pick up passengers, and what do they see as our weird <laughs> Twilight Zone fishbowl? slides in front of the people on the platform. Well, over here they see a homeless man making hats and saucepans out of newspaper. Over here they see an unconscious boy and a woman who climbs onto the seat and starts mashing her vagina into his chin. And in the middle they see me. And I look like my cocaine's been cut with rat poison. <laughs> And they take one look at us and, and weirdly enough, the normal people change their minds. No one gets on board our carriage. You can hear them going, it's so important that you use public transport because the roads are really congested and fuck that, we'll take a cab. And um, we take off and I think, this isn't so bad. We're like a little group. No one's gonna bother us. We should be superheroes. Yes, I've been awake for 31 hours, all right? So, and I was like, I am hemogoblin. You are Sherlock Homeless. <laughs> and fuck me, she, she is the invisible dignity. <laughs> now at this point, she starts sliding around a pole and I know what she was doing was crap because I've done a pole dancing lesson. It was part of a hen night. <laughs> and um, the hen night involved a pole dancing lesson because the woman who was, who was the hen was actually an ex-Olympic swimmer. This is my friend, she's tall, she's tan, she's athletic. She got on that pole, she was like, I can barely do that with my fingers. <laughs> she went, your turn! 
But I was like, no. And I, she made me wear shorts. I don't look good in shorts. I'm very white. I reflect a lot of light. And um, you know when something burns against your skin, like, I don't know, a brass pole. And uh, I don't have any actual muscle structure. So me pole dancing was basically this. Fuck. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I can't hold on. Just lower yourself, Diane. Lower yourself. <laughs> and it just scraped between my legs. All you could hear is this, yeah! like that. It was, it kind of looked like someone had harpooned a pig and then sounded like someone else had raped it. <laughs> so I'm watching her kind of slide around this pole and I think, that's crap. She's not even doing the noises with her legs. And, um, and then she started taking off her clothes. I don't know if you've ever had someone try and take off their clothes in front of you in public. It's not nice. <laughs> you don't want to see their meat plate. And um, she was kind of taking it all off. And I've had this before. I've had somebody throw their, their sexualness in my face. It happened on a hen night. <laughs> um, in that we went to this strip club. We were sat there and I thought, why are we here? It's disgusting. And I looked at the ceiling and I thought, what a beautiful ceiling, not this one. What a beautiful ceiling. It had high stone archways, and I was like, how lovely. And then I saw it had a stained glass window. How lovely. What? And then a stripper came on dressed as Satan. <laughs> and the DJ went, welcome on stage, Epiphany! And I was like, oh, it's a converted church. <laughs> oh, how lovely. Um, it's in a place called Northampton in England, and uh, they've called it Urban Tiger. If you have a church and you turn it into a strip club, you don't call it Urban Tiger, you call it Revelations. <laughs> don't worry, I wrote them a letter. <laughs> and, um, and so I was kind of watching this and I wanted to go home. And you know when, when you really want to go home, but I was very drunk, but thankfully I heard my brain through about nine shots of Jaeger. And the conversation was a bit like this. It was like, brain? Yes? I want to go home. And I, I know you do. Can't you, can't you just leave? I'm like, well, no, brain, I can't because we're part of a hen night. Oh. You know what? The quickest way out of a strip club is to be thrown out because you've molested a stripper. <laughs> That's a good idea. Thank you, brain. I'm going to do that. Yeah, you do that. Go on, my child. Be free. So <laughs> I thought, right, Epiphany's the closest stripper that'll do. So I climbed onto the gantry. And when a normal person gets onto a gantry at a strip, a strip club, everyone looks because they think it's like a car crash because we look like cottage cheese compared to these people. And uh, I thought, right, every moment up until now when a man has touched a woman, the lights have come up, the music's gone off, and he's been thrown out. And I'm like, boom, this is my ticket out of here. And I just walked up and I just touched the boobs of Epiphany. And nothing happened. <laughs> and then Epiphany brought her hand up, clamped my hand down onto her breast and started massaging her breasts with my hands. And I was like, uh, stop it, because if Jesus comes in now, I look like I'm part of this. And she goes, hi, my name's Epiphany. I was like, I bet you spell that with an F. And she started kind of taking me down the floor. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to go down there with you. And I'm between her legs and I can see and smell everything. And um, she tore off one G-string. Strippers have two. Do you know that? They have two. It's like a safety string. Um, and I was like, but it's too thin. I can see one of her lips. And I was just like, no, I want to leave. And I look at the bouncer. I'm like, help me. <laughs> And the bouncer's like, oh, Epiphany's picked a deaf one. And I'm like, don't help me. And I think, I've got to make this look like assault. Otherwise, it's not going to work. I have to physically assault this woman. Otherwise, I won't get thrown out. And I had one free hand. And I was like, I'm sorry. And I thought, please don't let her get cystitis. And I just pulled back my hand. I just went smack as hard as I could onto her foof. Um, 12 seconds because I counted 12 seconds between smacking a stripper on the vagina and being outside on a pavement. <laughs> it's basically teleportation. <laughs> Your head's at a very funny angle though, I'll tell you that. You're kind of out like this. 
Um, so I thought, I was looking at this woman kind of taking her clothes off and pole dancing on the train, and I thought, if I smack this woman in the vagina, maybe I'll get to Surbiton quicker. Um, but at that point, she swung around a pole and she kicked me in the knee. Now, this was the first time I'd been hurt and it wasn't my fault. And I just kind of went, ah. And I just wanted a little bit of sympathy. And what she did was she just turned to her boyfriend and said rather loudly, ha! I just kicked the ginger. <laughs> yes, Panto Man, you're correct. <laughs> and that was the moment I broke. And I just went, what are you doing? And she went, I'm a star in it. You're stripping on a train. <laughs> what does that make your stripper name? Miscarriage? <laughs> yeah, them's fighting words. Now the problem is, is that when I said that, I'm very middle class, and uh, one of my pearl earrings just went Pff! And um, a little voice in the back of my head said, we cannot fight her, we have no gloves. And um, now the problem is, is that if I insult someone, they need to have a certain level of intelligence to understand what's been said. She didn't. <laughs> She heard what I said, thought she worked it out, and then she said, Yeah! Miscarriage 2010! <laughs> I was like, this woman's so stupid, I'm powerless against her! <laughs> now at this point, Hobo Cop had walked up to join us, and he said something she could understand. He turned to her and went, Fucking women with your legs and your holes! <laughs> I was like, I think you've mistaken her for a golf course officer. <laughs> now she understood this, and so she went, fuck you, and she walks towards him, and I thought, I'm in the middle of Trump versus Trump. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want any more fighting. I've seen enough bloodshed this evening. So I thought, right, I'll stop it somehow. I will say something. I will detract their attention to me. I've got to say something stupid, something blunt. They'll look at me. I'll apologize. We'll all sit down. We'll get home. We'll be safe. And I stand up. I stand between them. As I do this, I don't notice the next person enter our carriage. It's a police officer. <laughs> one of the special ones that they have looking for drunks. And I stand up between these two people and get their attention. I just say, all right, then, which one of you two strippers am I gonna smack in the cunt this time? <laughs> Covered in blood. Who does he want to talk to? And he pulls me off the train and we stood on the station, but the best thing was, it was Surbiton. We had made it past Libya, we'd made it past purgatory, we were in Surbiton, and I just had to look normal for five fucking minutes in front of one police officer. And you know what our conversation was? This was our conversation. Is that blood down your front? What are you, a hairdresser? <laughs> no, I'm a police officer. Is that blood down your front? Yes, it is. How did it get there? I broke my nose with my arsehole. What's your name? Di Spencer. What, like Lady Di? Yes, like Lady Di. What do you think this is, some kind of tribute act? If it was, I'd be wearing a fucking steering wheel, wouldn't I? <laughs> you look weird. I could look worse. <laughs> in some universe somewhere where I don't sort out my problems, not only am I stood in front of you now, covered in blood, I've got a whisker, a tusk, and a monocle. Somewhere I've got somebody else's shit on my finger. And I've got a sausage up my asshole, but what I'd like to know, officer, is are you gonna give me a ferret this evening or are you gonna give me a box? <laughs> and uh, in answer to the question, he gave me a caution, which I thought was quite nice. Um, ladies and gentlemen, some of you have been disgusted and some of you have been delighted. That's kind of what I aim for at every gig. Uh, my name's Diane Spencer, thank you very much, good night.